So given this is a boring topic, I thought I can at least make an effort to, you know, be a bit more engaged in a discussion. So this is almost the last talk. We can get our hands a bit dirty. And I'd like to start doing that by looking at this. So you can all relax. We need to get our hands dirty, but there won't be any new protocol anytime soon. And the reason I'm pushing this out really strongly is every time you talk about the limitations of what you're currently working on, somebody will go like, oh, oh, they're changing it, so no, we probably, we probably should wait. Let's, let's not fix what we have. So people don't do this because it's not around the corner. But at the same time, not talking about it gives, you, gives people the wrong impression that we don't care about the current limitations. So Mavlink is so many things, I actually think we need a quick introduction. First, on the lowest level, it's this. It's a couple bytes on a bus. First in, first out, single packet. It starts with a start symbol, a length, a sequence number that is wrapping, a system ID, a component ID, the message type, payload, and a checksum. This is the Mavlink 2 non-extended, actually that's a Mavlink 1.0 non-extended frame. It's not the Mavlink 2 frame with signing. So, but that, that's what it is, like super simple. It's, it's even simpler than can. However, Mavlink really, really means something different. That is just a wireframe. What you really get out of it, it's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem promising interoperability. That is why you guys are using it. And when we talk about Mavlink, we're not talking about these bytes on the bus. What we're actually talking about is a social contract on how we do things. How we send information, what coordinate frames we use, what datums we use. That is the true value of the protocol. And that is true value that actually doesn't depend at all if you're now sending your bytes little endian or big endian or network order, which is the same thing. It really doesn't matter. It also doesn't matter if you're sending a UDP packet if you're pushing that through a TTMQ queue, if you, whatever, if you use ROS as a transport, the same way as ROS is two things, a set of semantic messages and standards and social contracts, specs, and a transport layer, Mavlink is this. So that's really, really important to understand. And so this layer is as a common message set which gives you the interoperability part. Then it gives you the microservice architecture, which is a parameter protocol, the mission protocol, and all that. And then there is serial port framing, which is sort of the least impactful yet necessary thing. And authentication in the Mavlink 2 format. The authentication is limited. It's based on a symmetric key. And so that's kind of the current state. And the one reason this protocol has been so successful is, first, it has been there at the right moment in time, at the right place. And generally, people underestimate how important that is. And then claim they did something right. So I'm not making that mistake. The second reason is things like quality of service, retransmission, um, authentication, command and control are built into the application layer, into these microservices on an as-needed basis. The result of that is that you get a super efficient framing, but you all get the functionality you need. For example, that commands get retransmitted. And so you kind of get something that's relatively rigid, crazy efficient, and does all the necessary <coughs> things, which is beautiful. Because that's what you need from a deeply embedded protocol that runs on a kilobits, kilobytes per second radio link. That's why it was successful. 
Now, this is a copy of the slide that I, show early, that I showed earlier. Now, if you go to that kind of architecture, if you start to talk to an onboard computer with 100 megabit or gigabit, and once you start to create this mesh of nodes, if you want to really pull the PX4 publish subscribe, ar publish, subscribe architecture to the ROS publish, publish subscribe architecture, this all gets into the way, right? It, it's not designed for it. It's an API protocol. It's not your onboard pub sub thing. So please don't use it for it. Mavlink has been horribly abused. What we want for that is a real deep proper integration. But at the same time, there's something new. There's a new pattern. Right now we have this radio link thing with the ground control station. Then we have this onboard thing. Now, what, what will happen now is that we're starting to have systems. Systems that are kind of a weird hybrid. It's a swarm in a warehouse. It's a swarm in a light show. It's a wider deployment. So suddenly you have onboard components that need to talk to other onboard components. And we have no concept for that right now. I mean, you have, like you create this horrible Mavlink bridge and then you, know, you spend like four weeks and you get very confused on your dialect and your life is terrible. We don't want that. So let's talk about it. What we can keep is the common message set. What we can keep is the microservice architecture. There's nothing wrong about having a way to transmit parameters. There's nothing wrong about having a way to transmit commands. But then on the framing, how we exactly frame things, we still need that serial port support because that's a core value of Mavlink over everything else out there. But then we can easily also use an IP framing with quality of service. Nobody says we can't just run straight on ROS2. Why not? Framing is there. We have a semantic definition. We, we could also hash out coordinate frames. So we, we do two teams, like ROS developers on one side, and PX4 developers on the other. Where are you, Tully? He's not here. He knows why. <laughs> Though, jokes aside, I mean, coordinate frames and semantics, those are the things that we need to understand and look at. These are the really important things when we talk about this because we're all invested into semantics, into the function calls. We're not invested into what's on the wire. Most of you have no idea what's on the wire. And then what we also need is encryption and proper authentication. When I say proper, I mean with proper, asymmetric, certificate-based, proper boot initialization, in-factory initialization of your, key, of your certificate chain. All that, we need all that. And we can't build it all ourselves. That's crazy. So we need to live off existing ecosystems. We need to look what is there in general robotics. We need to look at what's there in automotive. Because we, we really need to reuse what's there. But we can and should keep our semantics because they kind of really work well. And what also will play an increasing role is the other thing that kind of got abused is like, Mavlink is kind of, in some places, designed to be easy to work with from an API perspective. Like some of the messages, and I'm pushing back more and more on stuff like that getting merged. For example, there's no reason why you would have degrees in a message. Like degrees mean nothing. The world consists of radians. Right? I mean, put degrees into a sign function. See what you get. Doesn't exist. So from a protocol perspective, we shouldn't have degrees in a protocol. It should be converted. The only reason you have degrees there is that somebody with some basic geometric understanding like myself can put in like, oh, I want to turn 90 degrees. Right? But that's an API thing. And now that we have MAV SDK, we should keep all the things, all these considerations there. It's perfectly fine for that thing to have an API where you can rotate by 90 degrees. But that shouldn't leak into the protocol anymore. 
So I think that will really help and be a refreshing change because now people that dealt with Mavlink in the past really have what they actually were looking for. You can also say like, yeah, but now you need to extend the SDK when you need to add something and then you need to extend the protocol. Yes, that's all true, but guess what? Somebody else needs to update their drone to also support that. Because what we will see more and more is that outside of R&D, you will not have your drone and your app. That's over. It's somebody else's drone and your app. And so having a relatively rigid system right now with Mavlink is actually not a bad thing. It's in a way the embedded limitation of being rigid forced people to kind of accept like, yeah, it's, like, it's not exactly what I want, but it's close enough, so okay, I'm okay to do what's there. And that way we converged. So I think we need to also keep that. There needs to be a standardized way to control a drone because that creates interoperability. So with that said, I actually want to spend a good share of the session discussing this with you, looking at current limitations, looking at scalability, and how to engage with the dev team. Because right now, I really enjoy the Mavlink dev call because I can hear myself talking all the time. It's like, awesome. <laughs> and Hamish. Like, Hamish and, and my ego, like, they're really thankful for your contribution. So, to seat the discussion, these are things that are probably current limitations, or at least areas of concern. None of that means it's broken, none of that means it's a hard problem, but it's things that we might to think about as we move towards the next generation. And again, the next generation is not around the corner. Okay, so give me your laundry list and then go off and build your products. Forget about it. We'll come back when it's done. So apart from what's listed here, would you would like to, is somebody in the audience who would like to reiterate on this, um, add something? I'm sure there are points here that should be raised that we haven't captured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, what was raised was variable length for raise. What, what does that help if the message also, size Also, we have, if we run like a swarm, we have only two, uh, 256 drones. But what if we want more? Like Intel runs to thousands of drones. So is it, I do only have one byte. Is it enough? So first I would put up the challenge. Let's see if who is faster the protocol revision or you having more than 255 drones <laughs> in one space. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, the IP network answer to that was what's a horrible thing, which is, which is called network address translation. So if you ask me, you're not limited by that. We're happy to add that to two so you can scale and then build. You know, you know how long, like actually I don't know, anybody surfing on Wikipedia right now and not listening, maybe they can look up like since when IPv6 was un under consideration and what the current adoption rate is. 97. Ah, that's kind of fast. It's not bad. So I think what we need to look into as we revise this is to increase the address space but have a way as you're not using it, for example, for a ground station to one thing link, you're not paying the price for being able to address the whole freaking internet or every atom in the universe, depending on what number you choose. So... But I think, you know, address space and, and variable length arrays, that's certainly in a consideration. Uh, what Mavlink 2 already does is array truncation for the last array. So if you design the message, this is another, like, this is another Mavlink thing, right? If you design the message correctly, you get that. But only if you know. I think that, go ahead.
Yeah, can you repeat that? No, I, I actually didn't hear it. Sorry. Um, if I remember correctly, the Param X set in there, the array of 128 is not the last thing, or it wasn't uh, at the time we were actually implementing this. And so it doesn't get truncated. And with our um, bandwidth limitations, it actually got in our way. Yeah, I, I think it depends on the exact message <clears throat> and depends yes. on how, whether you have extensions there. So, yes. As, as I said, it's like subject to like three or four conditions, you get that or not. And that's, that's not great. Like, we need to get away from that. Hello, I have a question related to the third point. Uh, can you elaborate maybe a little bit? Maybe it's something that we're interested in. Good. So right now we have message retransmission for on the application, I would call it on the application layer of the microservices. So parameters get retransmitted, commands get retransmitted. But it's kind of, it's very efficient and contextual, but it's also painful to implement. And so I think there should be a retransmission method with a certain quality of service that you can just ask for and then you're done. Who wants to contribute that? <laughs> Good. So those are the current limitations. In the interest of time, let's also look at scalability. And this is taking Mavlink as it is onto an IP link with unlimited bandwidth. You know, everybody has 5G and you have global coverage and Starlink and Bandwidth is not an issue. So how does it scale? Um, well, certainly the packet size is something we could talk about. I would actually advise to not necessarily go over the st standard wireless MTU of 1.5 kilobytes. Uh, but, you know, we need larger packets because you start to pay for the overhead. Um, we need security in terms of authentication and encryption and beyond what we have, which is a good baseline, but with, with something that can be more easily deployed in a really secure fashion. We need better quality of service. Again, it's on the application microservice level right now already implemented, and it's working reasonably well, but it's, like, it's not easy to add another thing without being sort of deep down in the protocol guts. Anything that is not on here that should be on here. So Hamish said um, it's probably important that it's easier to understand how to talk to an individual component, um, how, to, how to actually build a microservice. So I think it's generated documentation for the protocol dependencies of individual microservices. So as you look at a spec, you know, okay, this is how it works. These are the dependencies. And as we standardize more things like retransmission, it's also a bit easier to understand because then you go like, okay, this is retransmission, and I don't actually understand what it's doing, but it's kind of there. Right now, you need to understand how to do it. Uh, what about the uh, protocol capabilities? Um, that's also one of the things that goes in the same direction as retransmission, which is now handled in software um, on a case-to-case -case basis. So I want to know, is my autopilot supporting message X or service X? This discoverability, yes. Really important. Another thing that ROS does. Just bigger messages, transmitting images, video of a modeling. Yeah, I, I think bigger messages and automatic fragmentation. Again, there are clever people who have solved that. Like, you know, I'm, I'm sure like 100 times in the last 50 years, but like recent implementations, things like DDS, fast RTPS, yes.
Right. Um, synchronization. If you want to update a few parameters on the drone and be sure that either all of them are accepted or none. Transactions. Yes. Basically, yes. Yeah, Ramon, I think you have to go back there. Can, can you ask a question next? But wait, wait, not yet. Uh, now. So in extension to the just, routing, just I think it's the, um, uh, right now you can, you can s set a component ID or target ID, uh, which is either zero, so all systems, or uh, just a single uh, component ID or um, uh, system. Um, the differentiation between I want to send a message to all ground stations that are listening on this network or all whatever component, I think either it's already working but not clear that it should work that way and not implemented as such uh, or should be uh, uh, something to consider. That's interesting. I, like off the top of my head, I would think if you would send a message to all systems and a ground station component ID, we can build that into V2 in a not very beautiful way. But being able to send to certain device types, and I think that's pretty much above any middleware. This is like software that we would need to build, but I can totally see that that makes sense. You would also want to send a transponder message that way. Will you likely consider support for multicast, IGMP, leaves and joins? Yes, um, although I'm generally good at knowing what I don't know, and I don't know like how scalable existing middleware solutions are once you pull them on multicast, what, what corner cases they run into, so to, to, be, un to be analyzed. Can you raise your hand, please? Um, on the topic of target uh, system ID and component ID, it would be nice if they would be part of a generic message and not each specific message. Because you can't right now make a router not without understanding every single message. So that is actually a problem that's solved in V2. So there is, for every packet that has a target component ID, a, an offset that shows you where that is. And if, if the offset is I need to, I think if the offset is zero, um, it might be a negative number, I need to look, but then essentially you know it's a broadcast. It's the same value as zero. So you can do that with version two completely automatically with the C library. I'm just wondering which of these things that we're discussing actually belong into the protocol and which of them maybe could be included in the Mavis DK? That is a very good question. So for me, a lot of it needs to be on the transport, on the transport, not necessarily on the semantics. But uh, maybe such things as the retransmission um, could be pushed to the Mavis DK to just encourage people to use it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yes. Do you want to talk about to that, like, one minute? So I believe as an end user, you don't care. You just don't care at all. As the Mav SDK developer, you know, you actually prefer if you don't have to implement like three different ways of doing retransmission. Y yes, then you should start using it. <laughs> the other thing is um, retransmission and quality of service are closely linked. You cannot build a good quality of service system without factoring in retransmission, because otherwise you have this really high priority message that gets retransmitted and trashes your safety critical messages in the process because you have link congestion. So that's why I think 
And we, we kind of manage that right now on the application layer and in the autopilot specifically and on the ground station and Mav SDK side. Uh, so it's all good, like we have actually good performance, but you need to know too much about the protocol intrinsics, and that's why I think it would help to have it in the transport. Good, um, one last point, I'm almost done. Uh, how do you engage? If you have now all these great ideas and you want to change the world and replace 13 standards by introducing the 14th, then you can absolutely do it. Join the bi-weekly dev call. We probably will make you talk about really tactical short-term things like should it be a float or an int um, in the calendar, but we also have the right people there and more attendance than just PX4 to actually talk about, you know, what is, what is the vision? What is the next step evolution? And that would also be the right point, also the Slack channel, to raise things like, hey, I've come across this cool thing that's a total Ross killer. Why don't you, you know, look at that transport? And because I've said a couple times Ross, we're not going to, you know, use Ross as Ross. We're going to put the semantics onto DDS transport and allow people to use a single transport layer implementation if we were to go that route probably also backwards compatible, and probably also in a way that could be really easily interfaced with QoS to, to serial links. Because again, Mavlink is a protocol built for a stable API. ROS is a protocol for intervehicle communication right now. And the basic promise of Mavlink is that you can connect to a drone in a very standardized way, and you can do it let it do high-level stuff without starting to touch the guts, which also means there will be access control needed. And so also in the future, there always will be sort of this internal thing that has full system access and an external level of access and control. And maybe we can converge on a technology a bit, but it will be different things for different people because it's different type of developers. Thank you.